In this video, Jordan Peterson talks about the fundamental problem that every individual needs to solve for themselves. I offered you the proposition last week that we view the world essentially through a narrative lens. And I believe that we view the world through a narrative lens because the fundamental problem that we have to solve as living creatures is how we should act in the world. And that means how we should act to maintain ourselves but also how we need to act in relationship to other people and in relationship to the broader world in order to maintain ourselves across time so that's a complicated problem, right? it's not just how you survive it's how you survive now and next week and next month and next year and fifty years from now and maybe your, your, uh, your descendants as well if the culture is going to stabilize and then not only you across all those time frames, but you and everyone else across all those time frames it's a viciously difficult problem and so I would say that we have evolved mechanisms to solve that um, I think that's self-evident in some sense because for example one of the mechanisms that animals have evolved to deal with the problem of social being even if they're not particularly social animals is the dominance hierarchy, right? or you could call it a hierarchy of authority or power because I think considering human structures, social structures as mere power structures is a, a, a terrible mistake, it's a terrible oversimplification um, because power is by no means the only, like force is what I mean force is not a stable way of solving the problem of how to live together across time the question is, what is the stable way of solving how to live together across time? And that really is the question, and it's part of the question that I'm trying to answer partly because it's a perennial problem, right? We, we face the problem of how to organize ourselves in small social units without undue conflict and then we face the larger problem of how to organize ourselves into large social units without undue conflict and that conflict can be absolutely devastating and, and, and frequently is so, so then I would also say that the first way of solving this problem isn't conscious you see, not at all and you know, you may know and you may not know that there are there are different forms of memory right, really technically different forms of memory so for example, there's short term working memory which is the memory that you use to hold things like telephone numbers in your active imagination, it decays very rapidly it's only about four to seven bits which is why, well, it's why phone numbers are, were at least seven digits long you know, you can kind of manage that as a loop that, and then there's um, episodic memory and that has two elements, one is semantic and the other is uh, episodic it's, uh, What's the name of that? Hmm? Someone's, someone said something? Yes, well there's procedural memory and then there's, there's another the kind of memory that you use to represent your experiences to yourself so let's say it's image laden and the other one is semantic and semantic is your memory for facts and those are quite different so for example, procedural memory that's how you ride a bike that's how you play the piano, that's how you play jazz music if you're in a combo it's, it's the memory, it's, in fa it's, it's a funny kind of memory because it's actually built right into you, you know, I mean so is, so is the kind of memory that you use to represent your own life but it's much more malleable in some sense so what that means is that in your procedures there is information that you don't know about it's patterned information that you don't know about part of that is how to act you know, like when you walk into a social gathering you don't really think through how you're going to act you, you know how to act and if someone asked you exactly what it is that you're doing and why you could formulate a story about it but the probability that, that it's the existence of that story that enabled you to act that way is zero because you have to react way faster than that and so, you know, you have social knowledge built into your nervous system because you've practiced being a social being for a very long period of time and of course then that social being has been shaped for forever really that, and it's the right way of thinking about it you know we know that animals organize themselves into hierarchies 
uh, and we'll say of dominance because it's more, more true the farther back you go in time at least since the time of the crustaceans, you know, when we split from our common ancestor 300 million years ago and so, and it's true for social animals and non-social animals so even animals that don't live together in groups have to organize themselves into a hierarchy in the space they inhabit songbirds are a good example and they have dominance disputes all the time partly that's, you can hear them having their little dominance disputes in the spring when they're singing because basically what they're singing is I'm pretty damn healthy and I'm ready to go and if you're another bird like me you better steer clear of this tree and, and the, the dominant songbirds, you know, they don't live together, crows are social, but most songbirds aren't the dominant songbirds get the best nest and the best nest is the one that doesn't get rained on and isn't, it's not too windy and it's close to food sources and, you know, and so then they have the healthiest chicks and they attract the best mates and, like, it's really important where you're positioned in the hierarchy, even if you're not like a flock or herd creature, now we're more like herd creatures, so it's even more it's even, it's even more relevant to us, but there's just no escaping a hierarchical arrangement in, in, in social being that is social being and, and, and it's evolutionarily ancient beyond conception, so 300 million years ago there weren't trees, you know, I mean, so the dominance hierarchy is older than trees so that's really something to think about, and then, you know, when you're thinking about the reality that shaped us say, from an evolutionary perspective, but also from a cultural perspective what you have to understand is that the things that have shaped us most are the things that have been around the longest and so you could say, those are the most real things and you can't even see some of them, like, it's not like you can come in here well, it's not exactly true, you can't come in here and see the multiple dominance hierarchies that are at work you can in a way, because the chairs are set up to face this way, and I'm facing that way and that gives you some clues about the social order here, and you take the cues instantly, right? you come down, you sit in the chairs, you organize yourselves according to mutual expectation and that's part of your procedural knowledge about how to behave as a social creature now, that knowledge is really, really deep, and a lot of it's coded in your behavior now, and in other people's behavior as well and that's, you know, that's, that's the expectations you have of other people and of yourself and a lot of those are implicit, right? so, when we're interacting, there's, there's, a, there's a very large number of things that you just don't get to do and you know that too, and you won't do them and that way, we can act as if we understand each other even though we don't, because you're really complicated and I'm really complicated, and there's lots of situations where we might really be in conflict but because we share a map of the culture, the cultural expectations it, it makes part of our, it's built right into our perception you will act out that set of expectations, and so will I and if neither of us can do that, even if one of us can't, we're going to stay we're either going to immediately devolve into conflict, or we're going to avoid each other like the plague and that's exactly the right thing to do